This is Super Yacht News with Yves Sisman. Hi, welcome back to the channel. Okay, as I'm sure you're already aware, if you live in the US, there's been an incident where a ship's crashed into a bridge in a US city, causing that bridge to collapse. A 300 meter or 984 foot container ship crashed into a bridge in Baltimore, causing the bridge to collapse into the Patapsco River. Now, this happened uh, at 0130 hours this morning, 26th of March. Uh, the vessel actually hit the bridge at that time. Now, why are we talking about it on the channel? Because there's an awful lot of coverage and it's, a, it's kind of out of our wheelhouse. The reason why we're going to talk about it is we're going to talk about specifics of using AIS data. We're also going to talk about um, the, the equipment that the, that the ship will have that will help the investigation when it comes to it. Because some of the reports that we've seen on TV from CNN and other, other organizations the people that they've got on to talk don't seem to know what they're talking about. So that's what we that's why we are making a video on this subject. Now, between seven and 20 people were reported as being on the bridge and maybe in the water even hours after the incident. The, the bridge is called the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Now, the bridge connects two major counties in the Baltimore area, and it's part of the Interstate 695. Now, the rescue is focused on the water right now. Uh, with smaller vessels searching for people in the water and they even have divers uh, searching for the vehicles that were on the bridge that fell into the water. They're looking for survivors. However, after this number of hours, it's unlikely uh, that they're going to find anyone alive because of the water temperatures. Uh, the temperature in the water is reported to be 8 degrees Celsius, which is 46 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, in, in water temperatures that cold, a person could only survive for a few hours. Now, in, in water between 4 and 10 degrees Celsius, which is 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, you would be exhausted and probably unconscious after at least 30 minutes or as little as 30 minutes up to 60 minutes, you'd be unconscious. And the expected survival time in those temperatures is one to three hours. Now, of course, there can always be exceptions and they will continue to search until they're satisfied they've done a full search. Now, the vessel is called MV Dali. It's a container ship, 300 meters or 984 feet, as we said. It has a beam of 157 feet, which is 48 meters. That's the width, 95,000 gross tons. The ship was built in 2015, registered in Singapore, and the ship was heading to Colombo in Sri Lanka, according to AIS data. Ship was filled with hundreds of containers that would have all been full of stuff. Now, part of the bridge collapsed onto the ship, and as such, those containers would be a hazard of possibly falling into the water. Obviously, there's uh, potential uh, people in the water right now. So there's a, obviously that is an extra danger. Now, if we look at the track of the vessel on the AIS, we can see the ship seemed to be on course and traveling at 8.7 knots until a few seconds before the accident. Then the ship seems to veer off course. Now, according to the AIS data, she starts to slow down about four, 500 meters out from uh, the bridge down from eight knots to six knots and that could have just been a caution for going under the bridge it's unlikely it seems to be that they knew there was an issue and started to try to slow the vessel now we have to understand the track may not be 100 percent accurate the incident happened in a, a very built-up area and that can have an effect on gps which is what ais uses to work out its position so just bear that in mind however assuming the track is accurate uh, we can see the ship The ship does appear to veer off course just before hitting that bridge if we play back that footage. Now, a ship sailing under this bridge would have seen a number of navigation lights, uh, which would have shown the channel that they needed to take. Uh, plus, they would have already plotted their course on the Ectus to show where they needed to go. Also, there should have been a pilot on board. A pilot is a local qualified captain whose job it is to bring ships into port and take ships out to sea. In fact, Chesapeake Bay is the longest pilotage route in the US on, on the East Coast uh, with nearly 200 miles of waters. Now, according to the Association of Maryland Pilots, each ship engaged in foreign trade coming to Maryland port is required to take on a local ship handling specialist known as a pilot to navigate the vessel safely into port. Pilots are regulated by the state of Maryland under the Department of Labor State Board of Pilots. Now, watching a number of reports uh, on the subject, I saw this report from CNN. Andy, um, you mentioned, uh, again, we're being careful to speculate about whether this was an intentional uh, or accidental um, impact. 
And you did talk about sort of the follow-on effects, but when they're trying to figure out actually how this occurred, what sort of data is, tends to be available in these um, investigations? I mean, are they looking at computers on the ship? Um, what, what do you know or what can you kind of tell us in terms of what sort of information threads are available for them to pull on beyond um, just obviously, of course, interviewing the individuals who uh, were in charge of piloting the ship? Sure. So, the, you know, a lot of that depends, Casey, on how, um, you know, on the details of the ship, how old it is, what sort of technology it's equipped with. Um, you know, so that's going to really set the table in terms of what sort of information or data you have to work with. But you can imagine the entire kind of scope of GPS data and systems data uh, that really will show you exactly how, where, when the ship uh, was last kind of put on the course that brought it to impacting the, that column, um, the number of people who were involved in piloting the ship at the time, the sort of inputs uh, that those folks were delivering into those systems to steer the ship. Um, you know, there, there's, uh, that, that can vary greatly. If this is like a really old vessel that's in a state of disrepair and hasn't been kind of updated, that data could be pretty uh, rudimentary. Uh, but any sort of inputs that go into that system, um, you know, if it's on a set course that had been planned out, you know, uh, sometime before, it looks less likely that someone at the last second took it off course and uh, into that column. Um, so those are those are kind of some of the systems that they'll be looking for to see if they even exist on the boat before they find out uh, what sort of uh, uh, data they have uh, in in this situation. Now, references, comments about how old the ship is. Well, even an old vessel would need to have equipment on board to help investigations such as these because the equipment on board a commercial cargo ship is dictated by maritime law. So even if the ship was built in the 1980s, to be able to navigate into a US port or any Western port, the ship would most likely need to abide by, well, it would need to abide by the regulations and it would most likely have the equipment on board that we're going to talk about. Now, his comment about how many people would have been on the bridge at the time, well, uh, based on my own experience and the location of the vessel, you know, being just left port and, and heading through a, an area that's quite, uh, you know, dangerous navigation, the captain would have been on the bridge, uh, the chief officer and second mate uh, and or second mate, possibly both. Uh, a helmsman, as the vessel would have been under manual control at the time. And of course, the local pilot, who is a qualified captain and would be extremely knowledgeable of the area. Um, so having said all of that, what will the investigations have to go on uh, when they look on board the vessel? Well, according to IMO laws, all ships of 3,000 gross tons and above uh, constructed after the 1st of July 2002, must carry a voyage data recorder. We're going to come back to that in a little bit to assist the investigation uh, under regulations adopted in 2000, which entered into force on the 1st of July 2002. Now, there are some exemptions to that. It, it says in the IMO rules, it says that administrations may exempt ships uh, constructed before 2002 from being fitted with a VDR, where it can be demonstrated that interfacing a VDR with the existing equipment on the ship is unreasonable or impracticable. I have to say that would be extremely rare. Now, however, it should be noted that this ship was built in 2015, so this is not an issue here. So this VDR or Voyage Data Recorder is similar to what you have on an aircraft, which is often known as a black box, right? So, uh, so what is a VDR and how does it work? Well, the VDR stores ship's data and it's required to store at least 12 hours uh, meaning a 12-hour window of operation leading up to the accident. Now, many modern VDRs can store data for much longer periods now. Now, in the event of an incident, a button is pressed on the VDR unit and it will dump all of that data from the last 12 hours into a file. Now, what data does a VDR store? Well, the VDR has a data collection unit, a DCU, that pulls in data from all the integrated sources on the bridge. Uh, the VDR must record at least the following data, uh, date and time, uh, ship's position, speed and heading, bridge audio, communication audio from the radios, radar data, ectus data, echo sounder, main alarms, rudder order and response, hull opening, doors, 
the status of any openings on the ship, watertight and fire door status, speed and acceleration, hull stresses, wind speed and direction. So you can see there's an awful lot of data is stored by the system. So every possible bit of data, as mentioned from the Ectus, which is the ship's satellite navigation, if you like, down to even the conversation on the bridge at the time of the incident, that will all have been recorded. So everything that they were saying, there's microphones situated around the bridge, even on the bridge wings, so they can listen to what's being said. Now, of course, we're very far away from a report on the incident. Uh, right now, they're still in the rescue mode, but that will likely become a recovery operation very soon because of those weather conditions that we mentioned and the, the amount of time that you can spend in the water. Although I'm very, it's very likely they will continue to search until all of those people have been recovered regardless of their condition, right? Now, the likely causes. Now, of course, this is just speculation, um, but the likely causes based on past accidents is uh, human error. Almost 80% of maritime accidents can be attributed to human error, according to various studies over the last 30 years. Another possible cause is a systems malfunction on board. Now, many modern bridges are now fly-by-wire. You might have heard this phrase before, uh, meaning that the movement of helm controls are converted into electronic signals and then transmitted by wires to control computers, which determine how to move the actual controls, you know, like the rudders and throttles, etc. It's all done by fly-by-wire now. Now, any failure in these computer systems can cause a vessel to behave unexpectedly and potentially go off course. Now, you've got to remember that from the moment that the vessel seems to change course uh, until they hit that bridge is probably only 30 seconds or so. Uh, so it would have been very, um, it would have been very limited time to actually go into a manual mode on the ship. They do have manual backups, but it's, it would take some time to figure out what was going on. And they had very little time, I would imagine, if there was a systems function, a malfunction, right? Now, another possibility is, is it was deliberate, but that's extremely unlikely, all things considered, right? Okay, so I'm doing an edit to the original video that was filmed. As with, This is a developing story, obviously, and more information is coming in all the time. You might be privy to more information by the time you watch our video, but we've heard that two people have been rescued from the water, which is great news. Uh, we also heard that the vessel called out a mayday before the ship hit the bridge, and they were that's why they were able to close the bridge to traffic. I think the people who were on the bridge may have been the people who closed that bridge. That's why there was work crews on that bridge. Now I can't confirm that, but we we've, we've heard that there was a mayday call from the vessel. Uh, so obviously there was, there was a problem with the vessel. Like I just said in the video, as you watch it, uh, the vessel seemed to veer off course about 500 meters out from the bridge. So it seems like they did have time to call out a mayday and to and they were able to evacuate that bridge. Uh, now that this is the information that's coming in as we're editing this video, so yeah, it might be uh, it might be corrected in the next video. But we just wanted to bring that extra extra information to you. And we may learn more soon after they talk to the crew and pilot, but a full report will be at least a year away, I would imagine. Anyway, I'll leave it there. I hope they do find everybody who's missing. Um, obviously, we are thinking about the family of the people who are, are missing right now, and we hope that they can find them all alive and well. All right, guys, we will uh, leave it there, and we'll give you some updates as and when we know more. We're going to concentrate on the specifics like we've done in this video rather than just general reports, I think. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I'll catch up with you soon. Bye-bye.